Hello once again and welcome to the Amalgamated with Christ Church where the purpose statement remains the same to bring people back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us to study the Word. To study the Word and uh, the end goal we have so that we can rightly ascertain, we can rightly see what is of God versus what is not of God. Because a lot of things today, they are manufactured. And because they are manufactured, because they are manufactured, it gives many on the outside things to say. Sometimes they'll say things that the Bible is not real. The Bible is this, the Bible is that, and and, 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 and they, can't, they, 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 they can't support it. And so that is the main reason we are to study. And one of the questions that um, I'm asking you, and many people are asking, even people in churches are asking, but the answer is here in Scripture. And tonight, we're going to look at does the Bible contradict itself? Does the Bible contradict itself? You see, many times you may read a portion of Scripture, or you re read certain portion of the Bible, and there appears to be contradiction to many. And so many would tend to disagree in certain things, and so you have various denominations, various religions, various different sects, various everything. And so, let me say this. It's a very prudent question. Does the Bible contradict itself? Did the prophets or the apostles disobey? Did they make things up? Was it that someone just sit in a forest somewhere and wrote things down and presented it to mankind and say, this is the Bible, this is from God? Or is the Bible true? So, does the Bible contradict itself? The answer is clearly no, the Bible does not contradict itself. The first thing you must understand is what the term contradict means. Contradict or contradiction. When something contradicts, it asserts the opposite, or deny the truth of what is presented. Once again, when we think about contradict, or contradiction, we are talking about to assert the opposite, or to deny the truth. And so that's what we're asking, the question. And I gave you the answer. The answer is no. The Bible does not contradict itself. We must first understand that this Bible, the Holy Scriptures, is the Word of God. And so saying, it is infallible, meaning it's incapable of errors. It is perfect. And so, since it's infallible, it is never wrong. And because it's never wrong, there is absolutely no reason to doubt the trustworthiness of the Bible. Another term is that it is inherently truthful. Scripture is truthful. Scripture is truth. There is no contradiction in the Bible. We'll go into that. Psalm 119, 160 tells us the entirety of your word is truth. The entirety of God's word is truth, meaning everything. That is the first portion of the psalm. And every one of your righteous judgment endures forever. So though some may think that there is a contradiction, listen very carefully. Scripture is telling you this. God's word, his entire word, is truth. And every one of his righteous judgment endures forever. So those naysayers, one day you will come into contact or you will realize his righteous judgment because in him there is only truth, there is no contradiction. 
So the Bible does not contradict itself. Also, Proverbs 30, verse 5 to 6, it tells us every word of God is pure, meaning it's true. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. And so therefore, therefore, listen to this, do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Very powerful portion of scripture, Proverbs 30, verse 5 to 6. And if you turn your Bibles over to Matthew, chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, 17, to 18, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said this clearly to the religious people. Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. But assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled, meaning the word will never change. And so, does the Bible contradict itself? The answer is no. There is no contradiction in the Bible. What you have is many men who will want to go out and they want to change things around. And the scripture tells us again in Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God is pure. Verse, verse 6 says, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So I'm saying categorically, tonight and forever, there is no contradiction in Scripture. The naysayers will say, I can show you Scriptures that say things different from one Scripture. We will get into it. And they will say, how are you using the same Bible to prove the Bible? How are you using the Bible to prove that God's word is true and it does not contradict itself? You see, God's thought and God himself is beyond the comprehension of man, what we believe and what we think. And so because God is so supreme, because God is so, is so mighty, because God is so beyond our comprehension, God gave us a little bit just to make us understand what life is all about. And that is to serve him. The whole duty of man is to serve God. And so listen, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, it says right here in no uncertain term that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So man's comprehension or what man is trying to do in terms of to say whether or not the Bible contradicts itself and this is all a bunch of made up stuff is irrelevant. Because one thing I can say to you, that the evidence of God is available to man. And so all those who are naysayers, those who believe that there's a contraindication or a contradiction in the Bible, one of these days they will see. Because Romans 1, listen, verse 20 tells us, For since the creation of the world, meaning all the way back to Adam and Eve, since the creation is invisible, attributes are clearly seen. Its attributes are seen, being understood by the things that are made. So God was not, is not, will not be made because God exists beyond time. God exists forever. God was beyond time. God created time. And so if God is the creator and he created everything, as the scripture says, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing made that was made. So the word of God, as we know it through scripture, is the same for thousands of years. So I'm saying to you, the naysayers, will be saying, how can you use the Bible to prove that there is no contraindication, there is no contradiction in the Bible? So I'm asking you, naysayers, what should I use? You have got 
millions of books, millions of people, millions of different interpretations, millions of men who try to disprove the same scripture, the same Bible over thousands and thousands of years, and they will come with various theories, various doctrines, various everything, but the Bible still stands up to this day. And the most ironic thing is that Different men who want to show that the Bible contradicts itself, they too are contradicting themselves because they cannot agree on what the contradiction is. Though there may be four universal um, claim, and we'll get into that later in terms of where there is a contradiction. And so, men would want to challenge the word of God, challenge the authenticity of scripture. But I tell you that, the accuracy of such a challenge cannot stand up to God because God is beyond comprehension of man. And so the argument is always changing. But one day all the challengers will be found out. Because this is what they claim they are doing and they are investing their time. Showing that we want to show you where time began. One man had created an experiment in a lab, tried to recreate life, and it was a flaw. It was, it, was, it was a fallacy. And so all of this claim about contraindication has nothing to do with God because God is still supreme. Scripture says, Psalm chapter 1 and verse 4, He who sits in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision, meaning the Lord shall hold them in contempt, ridicule, or mockery. In other words, he scoffs at them. They believe they're scoffing at God, but he's scoffing at them. It says then, he, will, he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. He shall speak to them. Many challengers of the scripture, many men who claim that there's a contraindication or a contradiction in the scripture, they're no longer here today. They're not living. But he shall speak to them because there is going to come a time when each and every man will stand up to the pure judgment of God. The Bible does not contradict itself. Nor were the prophets wrong. Nor were the apostles wrong. Over the years, you may have had many versions, many different prints of the Bible. You may have transliteration, translation, and you may have some man who is translating from this language to that language, etc., etc. And during that process of time, you may have some man that mistake or deliberately change something to fit their narrative. But that is not the true and pure word of God. That is man's. Because the scripture tells you, you should not add to his word. If you add to his word, it is no longer pure. And so if you add to the his word, and then there is a contraindication or a contradiction, it's not God's word. It is your word. It is man's word. And you have had many corrupt men over all these years who do such a strange thing. I say strange because if the Lord God Almighty commands you not to add to his word, not to, not to take away from his word, why is it that it's been done? It has been done because man is evil. Man and a whole, we have this wickedness within us. And so that is the reason we have to be taught goodness by God. Because he is good. And so I say to each and every one of us, it's important for us to get a better understanding or a better overview of the original text. Not many of us will be fortunate enough to understand or to read a little bit of Hebrew, read a little bit of Amharic, or read a little bit of Greek. But we spend so many times researching so many frivolous things online. Sometimes if you go into the scriptures and you see something and it's not clearly understood or it appears ambiguous, you may want to go and research the original text that the scripture was written in. It's available for us. Some words or concept, though it's translated or transliterated for us to understand today, it has no pronunciation in the original text. Even today, that is not a strange thing. You have certain languages or certain culture that there is no way to pronounce certain things for us to be able to write it, for us to be able to name it. So what do we do? We devise a concept. 
For example, I may be using this microphone. You may have some culture that there is no such a word as a microphone. And so they will devise something or some language or some mean of communication to show that this is what it is. And so in the original text of scripture, not everything we were reading right here in the English speaking world or different languages was able to be translated or transliterated. Typical example when you speak of someone asked me once, what's the name of God? And I go back to the scripture. Moses, Moses himself, when he had an encounter, said, who should I tell? Send me. And God said, I am. And if you go back to the original text and you read everything, when I say and I mention the, the, the tetragrammaton, and you go all the way back into the Hebrew and you will see what that is. And you look, you'll see that there was no pronunciation. Why H W H? There was no pronunciation. How can you make that? Oh, okay. there is no, there is no vowels, so we to clearly pronounce it. And so, in other words, God made made His name as I am. He is always is. He will always be there. He is always forever. He was there in the past. He's there in the future. He's, he's everywhere. He's always in existence. And so, it is the same thing in certain culture. They have no word. Our terminology for God. But they know of God. And so, and so, we try to conjure up things sometimes to show that there is a contraindication. But really and truly, it is not. A big one today, 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 today. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. You will read it and you will see it. Let's look at it. Sometimes man will say there's a country. It's not a country indication. That's why I say go back to the original text. It said Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those days. Some translation will say Nephilim. Giants on the earth in those days. Now if you go back into the original or go back and you look into it's transliterated as giants. Go back into the Hebrew say Nephilim. The Hebrew word Nephilim is, it was translated, transliterated as giant or the fallen ones. When translated to English, Nephilim are not half angels and some people would want to say. Because this is a portion of scripture that some people will say, oh, because they read down and say there were giants on the earth in those days. Also after when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. Those were mighty men. So I say to you, my brothers and sisters, you must study to show yourself approved. That's the reason the scripture says, for he gave unto some, in the book of Ephesians, Jesus Christ himself gave unto some, some to be teachers, some to be preachers. I'm stopping right there. Because those are the popular ones today. Many men will get up and they want to be teachers and preachers, but they were never given any commission by God. They may have received such a commission from a seminary, received such a commission from their church, or, or even take it upon themselves. What am I trying to say? This portion of scripture clearly, if you read it in the original context and everything, and even if you read it as plain as it is right now, it did not tell you about any fallen angels. But men suddenly took it on them themselves. Just, oh, the Nephilims were angels. First thing I want to caution you and tell you, uh, a, a prime example of a Nephilim in scripture is the, uh, was the warrior Goliath, which was slew by David. He was not a fallen angel. He was an evil man. He was a Philistine. He was a Philistine warrior. Mighty warriors, they call them. So to think that they're half angel when they're just human beings, I'm not going to go into all that. I'm just showing you a point. First thing I want to tell you that angels are spiritual beings. And if they are spiritual beings, they cannot, they cannot have any relationship with the human beings. They are spiritual beings. They have no body and able to procreate. Scripture tells you in no uncertain terms, listen, look at this, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies 
your footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Angels are those the servants being sent. There's no way the angel is going to come and change from angel into being a man. Take on himself a wife and have children and have offsprings that are now giants. Go back to the text. So right there, there is no contraindication with scripture. Because there is no angels having no affair with any human being. They are ministering spirit as spirit. You can't see the spirit. You can't beat up the spirit. You can you 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 can chase down the spirit. You can throw rocks at the spirit. But yet still, man would want to conjure up this thing. And so what, when I said earlier that you should not just take it unto yourself and say that you are a preacher or a teacher and you were never given a commission. Because then you will spread things like this, saying that, oh, angels did it, and then certain people will believe that stuff. And so it appears as if there is a contraindication. There is no contraindication. It's just a man's interpretation which is wrong. Angels are ministering spirits. You have good angels and you have bad angels. Satan and his hosts of demons, they're all fallen angels. They're bad angels. They're not interested in having any children with us. Why do I say that? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us in no uncertain terms. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not fight against those we can see, but against who? Rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts. Spiritual us. The spiritual us may influence the flesh, influence someone to do something that's out of character. Why do I say that? Because there has been an influence since the beginning. Genesis chapter 3 outlined the deception, the influence that Satan, the dragon, the serpent had on Eve. She was influenced, she was deceived into sin. There was no procreation and, and none of that stuff. That is nonsense. That is garbage. So there, let's strike that one out. There's no contraindication right there. Some may represent giants or Nephilims and want to tell you that, oh, they're, they're, they're angels. No, 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 no. You have various interpretation of that. As to which descendant and which lineage they came from. But I assure you, it was not angels as we are to think of as the spiritual beings coming into contact with human beings and producing offspring. So you're saying that's all well, but why is it that some verses are different? I like to say this to you. If you look at the scripture... Yes, you may see verses and they may appear different. Most often, it's due to a lack of comprehension, a lack of knowledge on those of us who are reading it. Most often, it may be due to a cultural bias. Most often, we may want to read into the text to pick out what we want to pick out. We cannot scheme over scripture. We cannot verse pluck scripture and expect to get the revelation. We must first... We must first, we must first resort to a relationship with the Holy Spirit. The job of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of the teaching of God. And scripture is clear in its is an intention, but you have to be patient enough to want to read it, to want to digest it, to, uh, to allow yourself to get the revelation, the proper re revelation. And sometimes just reading it, depending on the translation that you have, if those of you who have a very old translation, a very old English translation that's filled with the thou and the thus, etc., you will never fully understand the scripture. So don't hold on to it and you cannot understand the old translation because language do changes. I'd say it's better for some of you to go and get a version that is clearer to you. You have different, different versions these days. I'm not going to promote anyone. But you have some versions that are as clear as crystal. You can read it. It may sound different from the 
old one that your grandma or your granddad got. But I assure you, it is the same thing. Language changed over time. For example, once upon a time, they had no J in the English language. So a lot of people say, oh, that's a country, that's a country. We had no J, so where did you get this Jesus from? Hmm. Once again, for example, if there is something that's available in another culture, you do not know the name of it. They do not know what to tell you. They do not know how to, how to pronounce it or to tell you the name. But they know what it is. They know the concept. And so you, you may go away with this and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to call it ABC. And so the ABC terms become universal. It's the same thing. There was no J in the English language. You say, oh, there was no Jesus back then. It was Yeshua. And they can go on and on. But universally, when you say Jesus, it doesn't matter whether or not there was a J, whether or not we, we know who we're talking about. We know we're talking about the Son of God. So that's a fallacy to think that because language change, that there's a contradiction. There's no contradiction. Language change every day. You may have a contract. And the contract may be, may be updated to reflect something else, reflect the change of the situation. But you're still being held to that contract. You're going to say, you're not, if you don't sign it, you do not get the benefit of it. What am I saying? In other words, if you want to, or if you persist to read in the scripture in the language or a form that you cannot understand, you're not going to get the true meaning. For example, many people that like to criticize, I dare them to go back and read the scripture in Hebrew, in the Greek, and in the Amorite. They can't. But yet still, it was deciphered for them to read today. What am I getting at? I'm saying the intention of scripture is true, and it's pure, and it's to do one thing. 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, verse 15, intention of scripture and that from childhood you have known that the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith is in Christ Jesus. Scriptures travel as traverse time to make us wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus. Our scripture was, is, is given by the inspiration of God. Meaning it is coming from God. Intentional scripture we're talking about. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be completely and thoroughly equipped for every good work. But if you do not spend time and go and research, you will never realize the true intention of scripture. And so many times you'll come away talking about a contradiction. So you're saying, if the Bible does not contradict itself, why does it appear to do so? Let's go down, let's go deep into the matter. If the Bible, the Holy Scripture, does not contradict itself, why does it appear to do so? First, let me say this to you. You may have a Bible, and it is written in the language or the culture that you can understand it. So you can understand, the translators do their best, their very best to present to you so you can understand. They do it. Did they do a good job? Not every time. They don't do a good job at all times. That's the reason when you're reading the scriptures, reading any Bible from any reputable publisher... If they add a text in the scripture or add words in the scripture to make a point, they usually put a footnote at the end of the page to say, this was added to do this, this, this. This text omits this, 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 this. This text spells this, 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 this. If you spend time to examine your scripture, you will see that there is no contraindication, there's no contradiction if it's coming from a reputable source. But if you ignore what the publisher put into the, the, the book that he manufactured and present to you, then you may just read into the text and have your own personal views and interpretation. So, why does it appear to contradict? Because man may verse pluck. Why does it 
appear to contradict because men may want to give their personal views on the situation. Men will want to present the scripture to you because of their culture, because of their background, because of their family practice, because of what they believe in, because of their life experience, because of their educational status, because of their financial resources. And all of those that I just call, those, those, those reasons can alter the perception to make it appear as if there is a contradiction. Therefore, scripture must always be read in the proper context. In the proper context. And when you're reading it, you take very, very, very detailed notice of who was it that the writer was writing or speaking to at the time, meaning the prophets. For example, if you are reading something from the Old Testament, reading something from the five books, first five books, the Torah as we know it, if you're reading it and you see some of those things that were happening, stoning to death and the punishment and etc., etc., you can't bring that forth into the New Testament. You're saying, but why? The same scripture tells us of those things. But didn't Jesus Christ come and say that he fulfilled the law? Didn't Jesus come and give himself over as the ultimate sacrifice? So you're not expected to go on these days stoning people to death and doing all those things. No, 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 no. Because the same men back then, religious people, they were only given 10 commandments and they morphed those into over 630. A couple of those, uh, the greater amount of those were, 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 the, were the, the don'ts and some were the do. It was impossible for people to go around and remember everything. So Jesus had to come and bring clarity. So if you read the scripture and you're going to read it and you're going to try to live under the law, you're going to say that the New Testament contradicts everything, which is not so. It's a continuity, continuation. Continuation. So why does it appear to contradict? Because failure to properly observe the context often lead to self-interpretation. Failure to observe the proper context of scripture often leads to self-interpretation. Failure to be thought properly often leads to self-interpretation. And self-interpretation has no place in scripture. Second Timothy, I mean um, Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter one, verse twenty, say, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, or no origination, no portion of Scripture is subjected to. Any private interpretation. In other words, you can't sit down and say you're going to break down the scripture yourself. Who give you the authority to do so? Did the Holy Spirit speak to you? And so you see many people today conjure up all sorts of rules in churches. You don't, don't you watch television? Don't you watch television? Oh, you have sinned. You should be punished. Come on up here. I'm going to spank you. These things, oh, 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 you did that? You, go sit on the back bench. You, oh, you brought me a gift. Come and sit right at my feet. Man making up their own rules as they go along. Oh, you can do this. Man making up their own rules as they go along. Failure to properly observe the context of scripture often leads to self-interpretation. You're saying, I, I know that, but you have some portion of the scripture that does appear as if it's just so contradicting. For example, this whole argument about baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as highlighted in Matthew 28 and 19 and as highlighted in Acts 2 and verse 38 where Peter said, repent and let every one of you baptize in the name of Jesus. Aha! Uh -huh. That's a big contradiction. 
con contradiction. No, it is not. Yes, and but Jesus said in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Peter is saying in the name of Jesus Christ. How do you explain that preacher, man? It is a very simple explanation. But you have to want to understand it. You have to want to get it. The first thing I said to you that Peter was a student of Christ. Peter was an apostle. Peter was a disciple. He was taught by Jesus Christ. He was always in fellowship with God. And he was always attuned to the Holy Spirit. When Jesus himself said that the Holy Spirit is going to come and remind you of all things. So Peter did not do things differently. First you have to read the context of scripture as I said. You said but he clearly said in the name of Jesus. Let me let first let's look at the scripture. You can't verse block. You can't glance over the scripture, or else you'll miss the point. Acts two. Let's start from right here. Acts chapter two. Let's look at verse fourteen. Who was Peter speaking to? But Peter standing up with the eleven, meaning the other other apostles, other other disciples. Raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my word. Men of Judah. Where was Peter? Peter was standing in Jerusalem. He was, who was he speaking to? He was speaking to men of Judah. In other words, Peter was addressing his listeners who were Israelites. Men of Judah, yes. When there were utter, when there were utterance of tongues earlier, you have people who heard it in their own language, but then Peter stood up and said, Men of Judah, Peter was speaking, listen up. Why did Peter address these people? Peter was speaking to a Jewish audience. And if there were true Jews, they would have been, they would have been, they would have been exposed to God the Father, they would have been exposed to the Holy Spirit. And so Peter further clarified this point by saying this in the same Acts 2. Look at this verse 32. Peter says, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. They knew of. The Father. They knew of the Holy Spirit. Peter was saying this. Listen. Even David himself. Peter was saying. Even David himself. What David has said about the Messiah. It is now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Peter was addressing a particular population, as I said, if they proclaim to be Israelites, if they proclaim to be man, 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 man of Judea, if they proclaim to be such, if they proclaim to be from Jerusalem, they would have been in contact with God the Father throughout all generation. Because God proclaimed himself to be the Father for them. Where is that? Turn your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. If they were of the descendants of Israel, they were already privy to who the father was. They were already privy to the father in action. They were already privy to the Holy Spirit in action. First, let's look at where God proclaimed that he is the father of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 31 Look at verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplication. I will lead them. God is saying, I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. God proclaimed himself to be father to Israel. So they would have known that. They would have known about God the father. Remember. Who Peter was speaking to, we're, clear, we're trying to clarify, we're trying to show you that there's no contraindication, there's no contradiction when, when Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when Peter get up and say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. Turn the Bible to Exodus chapter um, 4, verse 22. This is God again. 
God declaring through Moses, listen, thus you shall say to Pharaoh, thus say the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Where am I going with this? The new God, the Father. You're saying that where did they know God, the Holy Spirit? Let's go back to where they know God, the Holy Spirit. After Moses had left, there was a time when they had judges. And most of the time, the judges, the judges didn't do anything of themselves unless the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now let's look at one of the most famous warriors in the Old Testament. Let's look at Joshua. Joshua. Let's look at Numbers chapter 27. Let's look at 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun with you, a man in whom is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in Joshua. Okay. Turn your Bibles to Judges. I'm showing you that they were familiar with God the Father. They were familiar with the Holy Spirit, but not the Son. All right, turn your Bible to Judges. And let's look at Judges chapter 6. And let's look at verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord. Right here we see God the Father, the Lord, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon. That's God the Father and the Holy Spirit in action. Then also, perhaps many of you are familiar with the man David. And you'll see where even David himself was inundated by the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit came on to David once he was anointed, once he was appointed. And we see also, we saw where also the Holy Spirit was on Saul once upon a time in 1 Samuel and the Holy Spirit departed from Saul. So they were familiar with the Holy Spirit in action. The Holy Spirit in action, 1 Samuel chapter 16. And let's look at this, verse 13. Then Samuel to the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. You see, before he was anointed, the Holy Spirit did not come upon him. Right here, it was saying then the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. He was anointed in the presence of his brothers. So they, had, they were witnesses. So they knew God the Father. They knew of the Holy Spirit. So when Peter was addressing these same people, Peter was in sense saying, listen, you know of God the Father. You know of the Holy Spirit. Now what about this Jesus that David was talking about? What about this Jesus? He was right, he was right here among you. This is the same Jesus that you are looking forward to. This is the same Messiah that laid his life down to you. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. And so, Peter had to confirm Jesus, baptized in the name of Jesus. So you're saying, I still don't believe you because in Matthew 28 and verse 19, it said, the name, that's a big sticking point, the name, it did not say names. I know it did not say names because there's no three gods, there's one God, the Lord thy God is one. And so Jesus, when he said that, the name, he confirmed one God and bear witness to all a triunity. So in essence, in Acts 2 and verse 38, and in Matthew 28 and verse 19, this the argument that man want to insert in today's society about which formula is right. This should not be looked at as a formula, my brothers and sisters. That's where the contradiction comes in. But it should be looked at rather in a way which we must demonstrate, believe in the triunity, believe into what they call the trinity. Jesus is the son of God and is God. And man make this into a contradiction. 
So if we were to look at it, and what do you want to say now? Who is right? Is it Jesus or Peter? Who is right? You see, the, contra the contradiction comes when we want to argue. And we want to insert our own understanding of what the scripture is. Peter was standing in the midst of people that were already familiar with God the Father. Familiar with the Holy Spirit. And so Peter is saying, this is the Messiah. This is the one that has been prophesied about. For unto, him, for, for unto them a son is born. The same man. The same Christ Jesus. The same deliverer. David himself speak about... And now he's here. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And so, the argument is not about, is not about a formula. There is no formula right here. There is no formula. There is no formula. Peter was the disciple, the apostle. Peter would never go against what God had instructed never go against that so Peter made it clear that he was speaking to a specific people men of Judea those of you who are in Jerusalem listen Judea and Jerusalem you're an Israelite so I'm, I'm speaking to you he came he came unto his own and they did not accept him and so Peter is saying, listen, he came, he came. This, this Jesus God has raised up, which we are all witness. They, the apostles, we're all witness. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God. How can you say that this is not the Son of God? How can you say anything differently? Get up and repent and baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. That is just further telling you what Jesus had said. So don't get it twisted that there's no contradiction. Man want to make this into a great debate point. I don't debate this. There's no debate in it. There's no debate in it. Jesus said, go forth and do such thing. Peter was speaking to a specific people. And Peter, uh, Pe you see, when, they, when, they're, when, they're, when they're talking about this, that's to show you the wickedness and the evil intent of men. When they're talking about that and try to say, Peter said this and that, that, they don't go back and tell you who Peter was speaking to. You can't read the scripture out of context. You have to read the scripture in the context in which it was written. And so scripture is true. Everything that was written in the past, everything was written in the past is for our learning. Not some of the things. Because everything is important. So if you're to choose some of the things, you're, in, you're, you're rejecting the entirety. Don't add or take away to his word. When you add and take away from his word, that's where the contradiction comes in. But I tell you, you should stop reading the scripture with selfish motives. Stop reading the scripture and say that, oh, I'm just going to look at it and I'm going to say that. Oh, look at this. And then you proclaim that this is so. I dare you to go around now. Go around. Some of you are still doing it. You want, to, you want to hold people hostage under the whole testament laws. You want to hold G you, 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 you want to make Jesus null and void. When Jesus told you in no uncertain term what his true intention was. He did not come here to do anything except to fulfill his purpose. Not for you to get an arguing or a debating point across. Not for you to say, this one don't know this, this one don't know that. It, 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 it appears as if there's contradiction, but there's none. If man would just be honest, but man, they are selfish because I want to rule this organization, you know. And if I dare present the people with the truth, they're going to desert me. I am going to speak it like that because people love the hard stuff. People, people love when I speak like this. It's not about how you speak. It's about what is the intention of scripture. And that's what it is. So there's no contradiction in scripture. So join us next week when we continue. In Jesus' name, amen.